Well, last weekend, Hannah and I went to DFW to celebrate our niece and nephew's fourth birthday. Uh, it was a, a fun birthday party. They, they had one of those huge bounce house obstacle course things. Um, and I uh, got to race Jude. And I think he, he legitimately won. Like I tried. Uh, and he won. So I had my socks on. I think that was the problem. Um, but on our way there, we made a pit stop at my parents' house in Euless. Uh, and Euless is uh, right next door to DFW Airport. And so there are any number of highways that are intersecting right there. And my parents have only lived there uh, since my adult life. They never lived there when I was a child, so I'm not very familiar with the area. And, and I've yet to learn how to get there without Google Maps. And, and so we'll frequently map it to get to their house. Uh, and last week, you know, I, I wanted to sort of challenge myself to get there without Google Maps. And, and we were about a mile and a half, maybe two miles away. And there was, of course, one of these highway splits. Uh, and uh, I decided to go left. Um, and it was not the right way. Uh, and the problem with this is Hannah had told me to go right. Um, and so uh, we, uh, you know, I took the left split. Uh, and about 30 seconds after I'd taken it, I said, we're taking the scenic route today. Uh, because I realized that I had gone the wrong way. Uh, so we exited the highway, I took a right, uh, and then I took another right. And then ahead of us was the highway that we should have been on. Uh, now to, in, in all fairness, to my defense, we made it there without mapping it and without getting back on that highway. Uh, so I wasn't completely wrong, but it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the optimal route that we should have taken. Uh, and then the question is, you know, why did I do this? Why didn't I go the way that uh, Hannah had instructed me? And uh, why did I choose to go this other way? And the, the short response is my ego, right? Uh, I wanted to demonstrate that I knew how to get to my parents' house without having to map it, without having to listen to somebody else's instruction, and uh, ended up getting me in some trouble. And this is something that, uh, that all of us have done at some point in our lives. Uh, and if it's not Google Maps, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, the stereotypical male failure was to not stop and ask for directions, right? Uh, because you know how to get to where you're going. And uh, lots of the women in the room are nodding their head right now. Uh, maybe, maybe you have your own stories about those particular scenarios. Uh, another one is putting things together without the instructions, right? Knowing you can put it together on your own. Uh, and then when you get done, there are like five extra parts that they've put in the box for some reason. Um, and all of this is because of the pride we have in our own abilities. Uh, we feel like we can do it on our own. We don't need extra help. I can do it. And we'll see some people in our passage this morning who feel that way about their own lives. If you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. This will be the, the last text that we look at in Genesis for some time. Next week will be uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus, uh, and then the week after that we'll celebrate the resurrection, uh, and I hope that you all will be there. We'll have an Easter breakfast in place of Sunday school, some time to fellowship and, and really rejoice uh, that the Lord is risen. Uh, but this morning, Begin with me in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now before we get too far into the text, I want to point out just a couple of things. Um, so we see that the people have one language. Now, if there was a time to work together uh, to accomplish something, it's now, right? When there's no confusion, when they're able to... Uh, to make clear instructions, uh, to provide clear guidance and particular, particular steps in the project that they're trying to complete. And so this is the time to work together. And then in verse 2, we're told that these people moved eastward. And now, if you've paid close attention as we've walked through Genesis, we've seen people move eastward previously. So when Adam and Eve are removed from the garden, when they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God places a cherubim with a flaming sword at the east entrance of the garden. Uh, so they were moved eastward. And then when Cain kills his brother Abel, he is punished and moves eastward eastward to the land of Nod. 
And so there's this sort of symbolism in Genesis where moving eastward is moving away from the presence of God. And so the the biblical authors are sort of giving us a hint if we've been paying close attention in our reading thus far. What's going to happen here in this story is not good. The people are moving further away from the Lord. So look with me at verses 3 and 4. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So the first thing that I want to point out is is why these people are doing this. And and there are a couple of reasons. Uh, The first one is that they don't want to be scattered, right? The implication of the end of verse 4 is that they they want to stay in one place. Uh, They desire not to be scattered, but to be able to stay together. And if you remember from Genesis chapter 1, from the very beginning, verse 28, the creation mandate was for them to multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it. So from the very beginning, God wanted mankind to be over the whole of the earth. Uh, but these people want to stick together. together. They, w- they want to huddle together. And I think there's a message for that in that for us as Christians and as a church, right? Our, our desire innately is for safety, to, uh, to sort of huddle together, to find our group of friends and just to, just to stick with those people, right? Not, not to really branch out, not to invite others in. We, we want to create a little bubble that we can stay in. And I think sometimes this is true as, as churches. This is true for our rural community, right? We like the community we have. We like uh, the small town feel. We like the safety of the small town. Uh, but from the beginning, God desired us to experience safety to then be, be sent out. God wants people to be sent out. And so I pray for us as a church that when we gather on Sundays, it's just as an opportunity to be prepared to be sent out into the world, uh, to be people who can witness to his goodness and to his grace. And the book of Revelation, the very end of the Bible, shows us a picture of what it looks like when all of the nations worship the Lord together. And this is why we ought to continue sending missionaries. This is why we ought to continue planting churches. Because the Lord desires for us to be sent out and not merely to huddle together. One other small note that I'll make about this portion of the text is we're told that they use brick and not stone. So so they create these bricks and they use tar for mortar And this is in contrast to a verse that I thought of in Exodus chapter 20, verse 25. It says, if you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. So even in their making bricks and their desire to to create the construction materials themselves, rather than use stones that are naturally part of the earth, they're perhaps demonstrating their own pride in their abilities. Now, this isn't a normative statement for today. It's not bad that we have houses built out of bricks, but I think it's sort of a symbol for us in thinking about contrast to this statement in Exodus. And that leads us to ultimately why these people are building this tower. And it's because they want to make a name for themselves. They want to be known. They want to demonstrate their ability, their capacity to make great things, to do great works. And they want their name to be proclaimed in all the earth. And we've seen throughout Genesis already how important names are. Adam was named after the ground that he was made out of. Eve is named for the life that she gives. And there are several other names that we've looked at as we've looked at the beginning of Genesis thus far. And names will continue to be important in Scripture as Abram is renamed Abraham, as Jacob is renamed Israel, Even in the New Testament, names are important. Jesus, in talking to Simon Peter, emphasizes the name Peter. He says, you will be called Peter because on this rock I will build my church. Because Peter in the Greek meant 
rock. So names are so important. But names are given, not created. These people want to make a name for themselves rather than receive the name that God has given them. And we're, we're caught doing the same t- thing in our own lives sometimes. Our, our culture is guilty of uh, this hyper-individualism. And, and in fact, the, the father of modern philosophy in the 1600s, Rene Descartes, uh, had a famous statement. He said, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. And he wanted to get rid of everything superfluous, everything that was extra around him, and get to the very base of who he was. And he decided the base of who he was was the fact that he was a thinking being, that he could make decisions, that he could think about his life, that he could make a name for himself. We're all inclined to think that we can make a name for ourselves. But the self-reliance that Descartes talked about, we see, is not new. It was there from the very beginning. In fact, this was the lie that the serpent told to Adam and Eve, that they could be like God, that they could be self-reliant, and that God was holding something back from them. And so they chose to eat the fruit that God had told them not to eat of. Look with me at verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And this is the turning point in the passage. And I hope it reminds you of the Garden of Eden, when when Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit, and then they hide. And we hear that God is walking in the cool of the day in the garden. God is searching for them, but they don't want to be found. And so God comes down to see temple that the people are building. And, and historians think that, uh, that the tower that's being talked about here is a Babylonian ziggurat, something like a, a, a large pyramid, if you will. And the Lord comes down and, and he sees the temple. He sees the tower, and this is what happens in verses 6 and 7. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And if you're like me, these are the most difficult verses in the passage. Because God sounds sort of like a jealous boyfriend who wants the people to just be dependent on him. And I think there's an important distinction between the God of the universe and a jealous boyfriend. Uh, a jealous, maybe, maybe abusive, significant other wants someone else to depend on them, but that jealous person isn't all-knowing. They're not all-loving, and they're not all-powerful. They're not all-good. But the Lord God, the creator of the universe, is those things. So it is healthy, it is good for us to be dependent on him. And if there's a time that we saw that our ability to do whatever we set our minds to is not good for us, it was the last century when there were great scientific advancements, and some of those did great things for society. But there are also things like atomic bombs, chemical warfare, the Holocaust, These horrible things that cause great damage to the world, great bloodshed. And the Lord knows that if we are capable of doing whatever we desire to do, that that can ultimately lead to our doom. So God is not just some mean, jealous boyfriend, but he is loving and not allowing us to do ourselves the harm that we are capable of doing. And God demonstrates his love ultimately in allowing us to kill his son, to put him on the cross. And that death of Jesus would ultimately take our sins, would be the penalty that we all deserve, but only Jesus would pay. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, 
Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And this is where we get our term, babble, from, that we use in the English language. When people babble on. And I, I think uh, the term babble, when you hear about a babbler, typically there's somebody who, who wants to demonstrate their understanding, wants to demonstrate how much they know about a particular subject. It's not just that they're interested in it. It's not just that they're passionate about it, but they want to be seen as someone who is knowledgeable. Someone who babbles on, wants to make a name for themselves. And we're told in the passage that the word babble sounds like the word confused. The word confused in Hebrew is balal. So there's a single letter difference in the middle, and that's, that's the word that's used when you see confused in your Bible here. These people desire to make a name for, them, for themselves, and we desire the same thing. We desire to make a name for ourselves, but God's design is for us to rest in his name. We desire for people to know how great our name is, but his design is for us to make the name of the Lord God Almighty known. And you'll notice that from the beginning of the passage, they wanted to make this tower so that they wouldn't be scattered, so that they didn't have to fulfill the creation mandate. But God comes down and he scatters them anyway. Because God's plans cannot be thwarted. Because it is his name that is great. And we might not build towers like they did in Babylon, but there are still ways that we try to make a name for ourselves in this world. Maybe it's with our, with our finances, with our careers, with our children and, and their academic success or uh, the activities that they're involved in. It can be easy to begin making a name for ourselves, w wanting to build our own little metaphorical towers and forgetting that God has called us to fill the earth with his name and to demonstrate his greatness. God's plan from the very beginning was to spread people that were made in his image around the world. And that, friends, is still the plan today. If you've read the New Testament, you know that Jesus comes, he, he walks the earth, he lives, he heals people, he teaches, and then he dies for our sins, and then he's resurrected, he comes back to life. But then when, before he ascends into heaven, he's speaking to his disciples, and he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus reiterates the commandment that was given in Genesis 1.28. Go fill the earth. But this time they're called to fill the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ. To demonstrate who God is. To make his name known. And it's in doing this that we fulfill the creation mandate. That we fulfill the great commission and rather than making a name for ourselves, we share about the one great name. In fact, in talking about this to his disciples before the creation, uh, Jesus in John chapter 14 says that followers of him will do even greater things than he did. And then in John 15, as he continues this same sermon to the disciples, he tells us how that is. He says that we are to remain in him as he remains in us. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We're called to dwell in that one mighty name. And in dwelling in his name, we receive an abundant life. It doesn't mean it will be a perfect life. And I always point to the apostles, to Stephen the martyr. When he died for talking about his faith, that doesn't sound like a very pleasant thing. But when you read about Stephen's experience, he talks about seeing the face of his Lord before his death as he was stoned. 
Stephen lived an abundant life as he shared the name of the Lord Jesus. And I thought about a passage in Scripture that we love to reference. There's, there's been a, a song that came out about it recently, Numbers chapter 6. This is a blessing that the Lord gives to Moses to then give to Aaron to speak over the people. And many of you know the blessing. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. What a beautiful blessing that is. Uh, But I bet a lot of us don't think too much about verse. Verse 27 says, so they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. It's by having the Lord's name on us that we receive the Lord's blessing. But from a cultural perspective, we listen to things like the Nike catchphrase, just do it. Uh, that, that popular phrase that, that inherent in it, implicit is in it, is to work hard, to train, to grind, to practice, to invest, to sacrifice. And at the end, you might make a name for yourself, just like these people in Babylon were trying to do. The Lord calls us to something much greater than a mere name for ourselves but to dwell in the name of the Lord Almighty. And so I would urge you today to ask yourself, what way am I making a name for myself? Maybe it's by putting my career above the Lord. Maybe it's even by, by putting my family above the Lord, by thinking about how to make the best life for my children rather than trusting that God will lead them on paths of righteousness. And and we so often in in suburbia fall into the trap of not uh, blatant sins, but of just subtly other things above the Lord God, of trusting those things, of trusting the name that we can make for ourselves above the name that has been given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You have been given the name of the Lord God Almighty. And the most sincere, the best, the most important work that we can do is that which he calls us to in sharing his name. And that might mean being the best at your to five. That might mean working diligently in school. That might mean caring for your family well so that other people see you. And they ask, what does that person have that I don't? And the door begins to open for you to share the name of the Lord God Almighty with them. So I would, I would urge you to ask yourself, Am I lifting up the name of the Lord? Am I living in his name? Or am I trying to build up my own? And for some of us, that might mean being specifically called in a vocational sense to be a missionary or to serve in ministry or or to plug into a ministry that already exists to make the name of the Lord Jesus known. Uh, There was a man that we've talked about before, Jim Elliott. Uh, His wife, Elizabeth Elliott, has has written about his life. Uh, Jim was a graduate of Wheaton College, the the Christian Harvard, it's sometimes called. And and Jim went on to be a missionary in South America. And, And he wasn't there for very long before he was killed by a native tribe that he was trying to witness to. And his wife went on to continue the mission to witness to the people that had killed her husband, Jim. And these people came to know Jesus. And a couple of them traveled with Elizabeth around the world to tell their story of redemption, to tell about how the Lord Jesus Christ had saved them, even after they had killed a man who was trying to tell them about 
Jesus. But you can imagine before Jim Elliott left for South America, how he received some pushback. Being a graduate from the Christian Harvard, he could have been a great American pastor. He could have made a difference here in the United States. And we can imagine that his parents told him such a thing. Raised, by, raised in a Christian family, his own father was an evangelist. And we can imagine they wanted to save their son some heartache and save themselves some heartbreak. They wanted him to be here safely in the United States, witnessing to people who needed to know about Jesus here. And this is what led Jim Elliott to write to his parents. I do not wonder that you were saddened at the word of my going to South America. This is nothing else than what the Lord Jesus warned us of when he told the disciples that they must become so infatuated with the kingdom and following him that all other allegiances must become as though they were not. And he never excluded the family tie. In fact, those loves which we regard as closest, he told us must become as hate in comparison with our desires to uphold his cause. Grieve not then if your sons seem to desert you, but rejoice rather seeing the will of God done gladly. Remember how the psalmist described children? He said that when they were as an that they were as a heritage from the Lord, and that every man should be happy who had his quiver full of them. And what is a quiver full of but arrows, and what are arrows for but to shoot? So with the strong arms of prayer, draw the bowstring back and let the arrows fly. All of them straight at the enemy's hosts. Give of thy sons to bear the message glorious. Give of thy wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out thy soul for them in prayer victorious. In all thou spendest, Jesus will repay. What is more desirous in making our name for ourselves than to have successful, well-rounded, contributing to society children? But Jim Elliott told his parents, there is something even greater than that. And he lifted up the name of the Lord for a few short years. And then the legacy of the work that he did continues to live on. Because he lifted up the name that mattered most. And it was not his own. May we lift up the name of Jesus rather than make a name for ourselves. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks to you that you sent your son for us, that he sacrificed himself for us. God, though he is equal with you, he did not take his equality with you as something to be grasped, as something to be held on to, but he became as a slave for our sakes, even to the point of death on a cross. And I pray, God, that, that that message would resonate in our hearts, that we would recognize what he did for us. We'll, we'll celebrate more formally here in a couple of weeks, but that we celebrate every single Sunday that he died and that he rose from the dead. And I pray, God, that you would lead us to make his name known. In your name I pray. Amen.